Of the thousands of aircraft types that have actually flown, just a handful have achieved what might be called greatness. Of course, what makes a particular aircraft great can be many different things. Technology, role, numbers produced, right place, right time, even its look. It's an old engineering adage that if it looks good, then it probably is good. And then there are the pilots and crews who, because of their courage and skill, have made an aircraft great. The story of combat aircraft is over a hundred years old, although it got off to a slow start as there were many military commanders who felt that such flimsy craft had little or no value in war. As Europe was rushing headlong towards the First World War, they had more pressing matters to occupy their minds. The Bristol Box Kite is typical of aircraft of this era. Based on a design by French pioneer Henri Farman, it became known as a Farman type, as similar designs were being built all over Europe. The box kite first flew in 1910. Made of wire, wood and fabric, it was the first design to be awarded a production contract for Britain's armed services. As its engine was mounted facing backwards and behind the pilot, the type became known as pushers. Other aircraft, like those pioneered by Louis Blériot, had the engine facing forward in front of the pilot. These were known as tractors. Both types of aircraft equipped Europe's fledgling air services at the outbreak of the First World War in 1914. Initially, their role was to provide reconnaissance and spot for the artillery. But soon, crews began attacking each other in an effort to win control of the skies. One of the earliest great British aircraft was the Avro 504, which first flew in 1913. Designed by Elliot Verdon Rowe, more 504s were built than any other British World War I design. Indeed, it was so successful that it was still in production in 1932. A handful even remained in military service at the start of the Second World War. The 504 can claim several firsts. It was the first aircraft to strafe troops on the ground. It was also the first aircraft to make a bombing raid over Germany, when four aircraft were dispatched to bomb the Zeppelin sheds on the shores of Lake Constance. Although one was shot down, the remaining aircraft were able to not only reach their target, but also score direct hits with their 20-pound bombs. A less glorious first is that a 504 from the Royal Flying Corps' No. 5 Squadron was also the first aircraft to be shot down by the Germans on August 22, 1914, killing both crew. Although the 504's frontline role was short, it continued to be used as a trainer, a role it was to perform until the end of its service life. As the air war intensified over the Western Front, new aircraft designs were soon appearing with mixed success. However, one aircraft was to have a profound impact. Although only 180 Fokker Eindeckers reached the Western Front, the Eindecker was the world's first purpose-built fighter. But it was a simple aircraft, a single-seater made with steel tubing and bracing wire. However, its dominance over the battlefield for the nine months from summer 1915 to spring 1916 means its long-term influence on air warfare is incalculable. What made the Eindecker so lethal is that it had a mechanism that enabled the machine guns to fire forwards through the propellers without shooting the tips off. This gave the pilot greater accuracy when aiming at an opponent. But the system was far from reliable, and as so often happens in wartime, three new British aircraft were about to enter service that would help shift the balance of power in the skies over the Western Front. The Sopwith Camel was equipped with two synchronized .303 machine guns. But what made it a superlative fighter was its powerful engine, 
The gyroscopic effect of the big Clerget rotary engine meant that the camel had a tendency to flick to the right. It claimed the lives of many novice pilots, but in the skilled, experienced hands, this instability made the camel highly manoeuvrable. It could turn in an instant, which made it arguably the best dogfighter of the war. By the end of the war, the Camel could claim nearly 1,300 enemy aircraft destroyed, more than any other Allied aircraft. It also played a significant role in gaining air supremacy for the Allies. In this struggle, it was joined by the SE-5A. Despite a difficult development, the SE-5A was to prove immensely strong and extremely fast in a dive thanks to its powerful Hispano Suiza engine. Indeed, many an RFC pilot, on finding himself outnumbered, was to live to fight another day thanks to the speed of the SE-5A. Unlike the Camel, the SE-5A was very stable, making it safer and easy to fly in the hands of novice pilots. And although it only had one synchronized machine gun firing through the propeller, it also had a second Lewis gun mounted on the wing. But the engine's unreliability meant that far fewer SE-5As than Camels were delivered by the end of the war in November 1918. As the war dragged on, aircraft were designed for specific roles. Fighters were generally agile, fast and single-seaters while reconnaissance aircraft were slow, stable, and usually crewed by a crew of two. The Bristol fighter was to prove the exception to the rule, in that although it was delivered as a reconnaissance aircraft, it was fast and manoeuvrable enough to take on German fighters and win. The Bristol fighter was powered by a Rolls-Royce Falcon engine, and when it first entered frontline service in April 1917, it proved vulnerable due to poor tactics. But when the Bristol fighter crews began adopting more flexible and aggressive tactics, they found that the aircraft was capable of being flown in combat like a single-seater. The pilot's single forward-firing machine gun provided the main armament, with the observer's swivel-mounted Lewis gun providing the sting in the tail. The F-2B version was to remain in RAF service until the 1930s, serving with distinction throughout the empire. The 1930s were to see great strides in aircraft design as monoplanes began to replace the biplanes. The threat of war once again served to hasten development. Alongside the Spitfire, Lancaster and Mosquito, the Hurricane is one of the four iconic British aircraft of the Second World War. However, while the other three came from new designs, new technology and new construction methods, the Hurricane was the last of a great line of classic RAF fighters. During the 1930s, Britain's military air services relied on a range of Hawker biplanes. But with the rising threat of another war with Germany on the horizon, the RAF identified its need for new monoplane fighters. By the end of 1935, Hawkers had built the prototype of the new fighter. Although its construction was similar to that of a biplane, its fuselage and wings were metal. It was also equipped with four machine guns and powered by the new Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. Within a few months, Hawkers received an order for 600 Hurricanes, an unprecedented number for a peacetime air force. By September 1939, when war broke out, the RAF had 19 squadrons equipped with Hurricanes. In total, there were 497 in service, with more than 3,000 still awaiting delivery. These production aircraft had a few refinements, including eight machine guns rather than the originally planned four. Hurricanes went to France in September 1939 and were heavily involved when the Germans attacked in May 1940. Despite losses against the Germans' BF-109s, 
The experience proved invaluable in the summer of 1940, when hurricanes and spitfires flew together in the Battle of Britain. The Battle of Britain was a watershed moment in the history of air warfare, and hurricanes shot down 55% of all the aircraft claimed. Also, the hurricane could survive much more battle damage than the Spitfire. Ease of production of the hurricane meant that there was never a supply problem. For this reason, all the squadrons newly formed during the battle were equipped with hurricanes. The Spitfire was undoubtedly the elegant star of the battle, but the hurricane was the cornerstone of RAF Fighter Command during that vital summer. After the battle, the Hurricane went on to prove itself as a night fighter during the Blitz of 1941. They were also used heavily in every overseas theatre of the war, from the hot and dusty deserts of North Africa to the steamy jungles of India and Burma. However, unlike the Spitfire, which was constantly developed throughout the war, there were only a few further marks of the Hurricane, culminating in the rocket-firing Mark IV, which were used so effectively attacking ground targets in Burma and India. Over 14,500 Hurricanes were built, with the last one rolling off in July 1944. It is now one of the few surviving aircraft flying in the world, and the last of the many is flown by the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight as a tribute to the pilots who flew this great fighter during the Second World War. The Spitfire is perhaps the most famous aircraft in British aviation history. Its wartime record, coupled with the classic shape of its elliptical wings and the instantly recognisable sound of its Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, make it one of the most popular aircraft at air shows 75 years after its finest hour during the Battle of Britain in 1940. The Spitfire was the brainchild of R.J. Mitchell, the chief designer at Vickers Supermarine, who had also been responsible for a series of successful, record-breaking racing seaplanes. The S5, S6 and S6B had claimed the highly prestigious Schneider Trophy outright by winning three races in a row between 1927 and 1931. And while there are no directly shared features between them and the Spitfire, there is no doubt that the experience of high-speed flight was helpful in developing the greatest piston-engine fighter ever. The prototype Spitfire flew for the first time at Eastleigh in Hampshire on the 5th of March 1936. Within four months, it had flown in public at the Hendon Air Pageant and the Air Ministry had placed their first order for 310 aircraft. Sadly, Mitchell died from cancer in June 1937, but his work on the development of the Spitfire was continued by Joe Smith, Mitchell's chief draftsman. Although the first Spitfire production line was in Southampton, plans went ahead for a huge new Spitfire factory at Castle Bromwich in the West Midlands. The RAF's first Spitfire squadron, number 19, took delivery of its aircraft during the summer of 1938. There were 10 Spitfire squadrons by the outbreak of war and 19 by the start of the Battle of Britain. No Spitfires went to France in 1939 and none were involved in the early fighting after the German attacks on 10th of May 1940. However, the Spitfires saw their first combat towards the end of May and intensively over the beaches of Dunkirk. Throughout the Battle of Britain, Hurricanes and Spitfires flew in defence of the country. There were a lot more Hurricanes and they shot down more aircraft, but it was the classic Spitfire that symbolised Britain's dogged defence. This was helped by the creation of Spitfire funds 
whereby local communities could club together to raise the £5,000 needed to build a Spitfire. After the Battle of Britain, the Spitfire got better and better. The Mark V dominated fighter command squadrons as they began their offensive operations over Europe when it came into service in 1941 until the even more advanced Mark IX came in a year later and became the standard variant until the end of the war. In 1942, Spitfires began receiving the bigger and much more powerful supercharged Rolls-Royce Griffin engine. This meant a change of design and parts of the classic Spitfire shape disappeared. Over 1,800 Griffin engine Spitfires were produced across six variants, culminating in the final Spitfire, the Mark 24. During the war, Spitfires flew successfully in every theatre of war. This showed the benefit of the modern design that Mitchell had created and the way it was able to be developed constantly including for the Royal Navy as a fleet fighter called the Seafire. In all, Spitfire production totaled more than 22,000 aircraft, of which over 2,000 were Seafires. More Mark Vs were built than any other. The Spitfire remains a classic, packed with power, but both graceful and elegant. It's no wonder that they thrill crowds at air shows all over the world. The Spitfires and Hurricanes' great adversary was the Messerschmitt Bf 109. When it first flew in 1935, Germany was well advanced in the secret training of a new generation of Luftwaffe pilots who would fly the latest aircraft. The first production variants, the 109A and B, appeared in 1937 and were used extensively in the Spanish Civil War where the pilots gained valuable combat experience. The best known and possibly the most liked variant was the 109E or Emile as it was nicknamed. Built in huge numbers, the E helped the German Blitzkrieg sweep all before it in the Polish and French campaigns in the early months of the Second World War. In the battle for France, all the French aircraft and even the RAF's Hurricanes were simply overwhelmed by the quality and quantity of 109s. Over Dunkirk, at the end of May 1940, the 109s came up against the RAF Spitfires and for the first time there was virtually equal contest. The Battle of Britain proved to be an epic tussle. But it was Luftwaffe policy that stripped the 109 pilots of their full potential by forcing most of them to remain in position as escorts for the bombers rather than range freely in open combat. But when they were given the freedom, they showed their full worth. Unlike the Luftwaffe bomber force, the fighter squadrons were virtually intact at the end of the battle, by which time the next variant of 109 was on its way. In June 1941, Germany attacked Russia in Operation Barbarossa and many of the squadrons were now equipped with the 109F. With more powerful engines and often carrying small bombs, the 109s roamed over the flat countryside, bombing and strafing Russian airfields. Any Russian fighters daring to take them on in combat were soon dealt with. 109F squadrons also deployed to North Africa as part of Rommel's Africa Corps and soon gained superiority over the inferior Allied aircraft there. Less than a year later, yet another variant, the G, known as the Gustav, arrived. Again, with a more powerful engine, it still had similar armament to previous 109s and was now beginning to suffer not only from the improved quality of Allied fighters, but also from the sheer volume of aircraft being delivered into Europe 
by the American factories that were now on a war footing. As the war progressed, so the American daylight bomber formations became bigger and more dominant. Large numbers were shot down, but eventually sheer weight of numbers and a lack of fuel told. By the spring of 1945, the Allied bombers had destroyed Germany's oil industry and most German fighters were grounded, unable to defend against formations of 1,000 aircraft or more. Throughout the war, the 109 maintained its position as one of the most successful fighters, even in the face of enormous odds. All the main Luftwaffe aces flew the 109 and two shot down more than 300 enemy aircraft. Despite the destruction around them, the 109s had maintained their position as one of the greatest fighters of the war. It was built in larger numbers, more than 34,000, than any other German aircraft and saw action from the Spanish Civil War of the late 1930s right through to the end of the Second World War. The Messerschmitt Bf 109 ranks alongside the Mustang and Spitfire as one of the greatest fighters in history. In 1941, the Fokker-Wolf 190 started to appear in the skies over France and the English Channel in opposition to RAF fighter sweeps. Such was the aircraft's performance that at first RAF intelligence officers refused to believe the claims. How could a fighter with a large radial engine outperform the streamlined Spitfire? Although specified to sit alongside the Messerschmitt BF-109, the FW-190 had very few similarities. As most of the Daimler-Benz engines were being used for the 109, the FW-190 was given a BMW radial engine. The FW-190 featured a wider undercarriage to make landings more stable. But the real difference was seen when it went into combat against the RAF Spitfire Mark V in August 1941. RAF losses mounted and for a year the FW-190 ruled the skies until the new Mark IX Spitfire was introduced after the RAF had managed to get their hands on an FW-190 mistakenly landed in Britain. As Allied bomber raids grew, 190s were used to take on the massed formations of heavily armed American B-17s and B-24s, protected by their escorts of P-51 Mustangs. Many were lost in the Normandy campaign, as conflicting orders and aircraft being used for desperate low-level bombing raids took their toll. By the end of June 1944, more than 200 FW-190s had been lost, together with 100 experienced pilots, losses that would never be replaced. More than 20,000 FW-190s were manufactured and they flew in every theatre of operations from 1941 until the end of the war. Many considered the aircraft superior in some ways to the BF-109 but perhaps the production of almost 70 different variants for almost every role imaginable meant that the available aircraft were stretched too thinly. The North American P-51 Mustang was one of the greatest fighters of the Second World War, ranking alongside the Spitfire and the Messerschmitt Bf 109. It was built in the thousands, but the aircraft may never have existed if it had not been for a British order. In 1940, the British needed a fighter with the range to escort bombers as they began to take the fight to Germany. But the only viable aircraft was the Curtiss P-40 and the production lines were full. North America approached them to buy B-25 light bombers, but went away with an order for 320 of a new fighter armed with four machine guns. Delivery of the first production examples began just nine months later in 1941. Just 102 days after the order was placed, the prototype was rolled out 
A few weeks later, the order was doubled and North American hit their deadlines for delivery. However, the Mustang's performance was initially disappointing. Its Allison engine lost power as it reached 15,000 feet, the likely height the bombers would be flying. But Rolls-Royce suggested trying the same Merlin 61 engine that was to power the new Mark IX Spitfire. This engine transformed the Mustang into a world beater. The Merlin offered increased range, speed and altitude, so the Mustang could now fly up to 42,000 feet, but still be a formidable ground attack fighter at low level. The Mustang is well known as the best escort fighter for the huge formations of US bombers that flew over enemy territory every day in daylight. The United States Army Air Force insisted that they could send streams of heavily armed bombers unescorted on raids in daylight against an ever-increasing Luftwaffe fighter force. But heavy losses meant that the USAAF had to change their plans. Thunderbolts and lightnings simply did not have the range required. When it came into service in quantity in the winter of 1943-44, to it was the Mustang that revolutionised the defence of the bomber streams. For the first time, fighter escorts could fly with the bombers all the way to Berlin and back. They could reach the oil fields of Plösti in Romania, one of the furthest trips for the bombers and one of the most well-defended targets. And as the war came to a close in 1945, the Mustang was the only fighter in the Allied arsenal that could cope with the speed and power of the German ME-262 jet fighter. In the spring of 1944, the low-level qualities of the Mustang were in great demand. In the struggle to gain and keep air superiority over the Normandy beaches and battlefields, American Mustangs strafed airfields and destroyed large numbers of enemy aircraft on the ground, while the RAF attacked V-1 flying bomb sites. The result was almost complete Allied air dominance over Normandy. Of the more than 15,000 Mustangs built, over 2,000 entered RAF service. The RAF Mustangs were used for RAF bomber escorts when daylight raids were resumed in 1944 and for ground attack. After D-Day, the Mustangs moved into Europe, providing close air support for ground forces. Mustang units operated with great success all over the European front, including in Italy and the Mediterranean, and there is no doubt that they had a major effect on the outcome of the air war. Mustangs also flew in the Pacific, but only in limited numbers. After the war, most piston engine fighters disappeared or were relegated to second line duties. But the Mustang showed its worth once again, this time in Korea, where it flew more than 60,000 sorties. During the Second World War, Britain faced a huge strain on resources like the metals needed to build aircraft. Even as early as 1938, the Air Ministry was looking at a specification for a high-speed, multi-purpose aircraft built using non-strategic materials. During the 1930s, de Havilland had gained considerable experience of building innovative, high-speed aircraft like the DH-88 Comet, using composite wood and synthetic adhesive. After several false starts, the Mosquito finally flew in November 1940. During tests, the Mosquito proved to be faster than a Spitfire, thanks to its two Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, the same type that powered the Spitfire. The Mosquito was flown by a two-man crew, the pilot and a navigator bomb aimer. The Mosquito excelled in all its roles. At high level, it was almost untouchable. At low level, it was so fast that it could reach its target 
and drop up to 4,000 pounds of bombs before the enemy fighter defences could respond. Mosquitoes were also used for photo reconnaissance and as night fighters. In fact, it was so good in all the roles assigned to it that it became known as the Wooden Wonder. Mosquitoes continued in production after the war until 1950. After the fall of France in 1940, Britain's only means of taking the fight to the enemy was with its bomber force. In 1936, RAF Bomber Command had been formed. Its role, when war came, was to attack the enemy's own military strength by bombing their air bases, shipping, troops, communications and all industries used in the German war effort. But in the first years of the war, the RAF did not possess a bomber powerful enough and in sufficient numbers to perform its strategic mission. By 1942, the Allied bombing offensive against Germany was faltering. The twin-engine frontline bombers used since the beginning of the war, such as Whitley's and Hamden's, had outlived their usefulness. They couldn't fly high or fast enough, and their bomb-carrying capacity was woefully low. They also couldn't survive against ever-improving enemy fighters. As a direct result of the failure of the Manchester came a four-engine version fitted with Rolls-Royce Merlin engines which flew for the first time in January 1941. From that prototype, very few changes were made before the Royal Air Force began to receive the aircraft, renamed the Lancaster, in great numbers. Number 44 Squadron, based at Waddington in Lincolnshire, was the first RAF squadron to receive Lancasters. They flew them on a few mining operations before the first bombing operation. On the 17th of April 1942, six Lancasters from each of number 44 and 97 squadrons attacked a diesel factory near Augsburg in Germany. It was a low-level daylight raid and seven aircraft were shot down. But they hit their target and from then on, Lancaster squadrons were chosen for virtually every major bombing operation for the rest of the war. Perhaps the most famous of all was the Dam Busters Raid, carried out on the night of the 16th of May 1943. Number 617 Squadron was formed specially for the operation, one that had a massive impact on the morale of Bomber Command, the RAF and indeed the whole country. It created heroes in the leader of Guy Gibson, who was awarded a Victoria Cross, and Barnes Wallace, the brilliant designer of the bouncing bomb that breached the Myrna and Ada dams. After the dam raids, 617 became the squadron of choice when a difficult operation was scheduled. Every time the Lancaster was called on to perform with bigger and bigger bombs, a little modification made it possible. In November 1944, the squadron sunk the German battleship Tirpitz in a Norwegian fjord using 12,000-pound tallboy bombs. By the end of the war, 617 Squadron Lancasters carried 22,000-pound Grand Slam bombs into Germany and destroyed vital targets with accurate bombing. The statistics for the Lancaster are amazing. 7,377 were built between 1941 and the end of 1945. They flew 156,000 sorties during the war, dropping more than 608,000 tonnes of bombs and an incredible 51 million incendiaries. Being at the forefront of the action, Lancasters bore the brunt of heavy bomber command losses, with 3,249 being lost in action and 21,000 crewmen killed. Lancasters continued in service with the RAF until 1956, but mainly with Coastal Command, as the bombers were replaced by new Lincolns, now, there are two remaining airworthy Lancasters, one in Canada, and perhaps the most famous of them all, PA-474, flown by the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, 
as a tribute to the 55,000 men of Bomber Command killed during the Second World War. When a local reporter saw the number of guns that bristled from Boeing's new model 299, he called it a flying fortress. The name stuck and the B-17 was on its way to carve its name in history. The prototype was built in less than 12 months and financed entirely by Boeing. And even when it crashed, it was still chosen above the Douglas and Martin competitors as it outperformed both. Initial orders came slowly and in small numbers, and each time small improvements were made until July 1940, when Boeing received an order for 512 aircraft. By this time, five variants had gone before, and this, the sixth, was the B-17E, the model that would bear the brunt of the first bombing operations in Europe. The B-17E carried nine machine guns, and most of them were not the smaller .303 guns used by the RAF. These were the bigger .50 caliber ones. The aircraft was beefed up with a much bigger tailplane and longer fuselage. fuselage. It could now carry 4,000 pound bomb load and was ready for war against Germany. The first aircraft arrived in Britain in May 1942 and daylight operations started just three months later. More aircraft arrived, this time mostly the uprated B-17F and it was in the spring of 1943 that the US AAF was strong enough in Britain to take their full place in the combined offensive against Germany. With the RAF bombers striking at night, the B-17s spearheaded the US attacks by day. It was two attacks on the ball bearing factory at Schweinfurt in the autumn of 1943 that persuaded the US commanders their strategy had to be changed. Huge losses, up to 20%, showed that daylight raids far into heavily defended German territory and unescorted by fighters could not be sustained. Deep penetration raids were suspended until the new long-range fighter, the P-51 Mustang, was available. When the Mustang was introduced into service over Europe, losses began to reduce rapidly. Losses dropped to around 7%, still too high, but enough of an improvement for long-range raids to continue. At about the same time, the final variant, the B-17G, came into service. This Ultimate B-17 had even more defensive capability. By this time, the number of guns had risen to 13. It could fly higher and its increased weight was virtually all extra defensive armour. And as the weight of bombing raids took their toll on German industry and oil production, so the B-17 raids became ever more safe. By the spring of 1945, the number of enemy fighters decreased and the losses became negligible. B-17s operated in the Pacific and Italy and the RAF operated fortresses in coastal command. But it was over Germany that it gained a fearsome reputation as a tough, rugged aircraft that could sustain much punishment and still reach the target. Air crews showed a preference for the B-17 and gave them names like the famous Memphis Bell. Over 12,700 B-17s were built either by Boeing or under license by Douglas or Lockheed and many still take pride of place in museums around the world. Sally B is Europe's last flying B-17 and flies regularly from its home base at Duxford Airfield. During August 1944, Allied crews came under attack from a totally new type of aircraft, a jet. The Messerschmitt Me262 was the world's first jet aircraft to go into combat. But thanks to poor tactical decision-making, poor training and a lack of fuel and other essential materials, the Germans were unable to realise its full potential. <laughs> 
Although experiments with jets began before the war, the priority was for large numbers of proven, more conventional aircraft. As a result, jet development was delayed and the ME-262 first jet flight was not until July 1942. Hitler, having watched a demonstration of the ME-262, decided that this was the aircraft that could win the war for Germany. So further development was ordered, but as a bomber rather than a fighter. This led to further delays, which meant that the fighter variants only became available in too few numbers to make the kind of impact Germany needed at that point of the war. When it finally flew in anger, the ME-262 was certainly impressive. It could fly at 530 miles per hour, which made it faster than anything the Allied Air Forces had. It was also heavily armed with four 30mm cannon, giving it the punch to take down large American bombers in one pass, in one burst of fire. By attacking at high speed, the jet pilots were able to shoot down 542 enemy aircraft with a loss of less than 100 of their own. But the war was taking its toll on resources and the jets were often grounded due to lack of fuel and parts. Also, their airfields were being overrun by the advancing Allies. The extra power of the jet meant that aircraft were edging nearer the speed of sound. The key factors holding them back were the aerodynamics. Straight wings created drag, and as German designers had demonstrated with the Messerschmitt 262, the future performance lay with swept wings. The North American F-86 Sabre was the first swept-wing aircraft to be flown by the USA and gained its legendary status in combat in the Korean War. It was also the most numerous Western post-war jet fighter, with almost 10,000 being built in the USA and around the world under license, until production ceased in 1956. North American Aviation had previously built one of the finest fighter aircraft of the Second World War, the P-51 Mustang, and were in an excellent position to build one of the US Air Force's first jets. In mid-1944, when both the British Gloucester Meteor and the German ME-262 jets were already in production, the US drafted a requirement for a single-seat, high-altitude jet escort fighter. North American had already proposed the FJ-1 Fury to the US Navy and chose to adapt that design for the Air Force. Unfortunately, this new straight-wing design could not reach the required speed of 600 miles per hour. Using captured German research data, the designers realized that a swept wing could help solve their problems. The revised XF-86 prototype flew for the first time in 1947, and during routine test flights over the next few months, the test pilots found that they could fly beyond the speed of sound, despite officially being a subsonic aircraft. In less than two years, the F-86 was in service with the US Air Force, just in time for the brewing conflict in Korea a war officially fought by the United Nations, but where much of the air combat was fought by the US pilots. Despite little experience with the aircraft, the Sabre became the primary air combat fighter for the Air Force. Their main adversaries were Soviet-built MiG-15s, which could fly higher and climb faster than the early Sabres. However, the experience gained by seasoned Second World War US pilots gave them an edge over their inexperienced Chinese and North Korean counterparts. MiG Valley, as it was known by US pilots, was the area northwest of Korea bordering on China and crossing the Yalu River. It was the scene of so many dogfights and helped to forge the reputation of the Sabre and its pilots. During the war, no less than 40 Sabre pilots became aces. Seven variants of the Sabre were built in the US, starting with the F-86A, 
Four of them were pure day interceptors, while three were all-weather fighters. They all carried machine guns and cannon, and had the option of carrying rockets or bombs for attacking enemy fighters on the ground. During the nine years of production, North American built over 6,000 aircraft, while Canadair built over 1,800 under license. It was more than 400 of these Canadair Sabre Mark IVs that were operated by the Royal Air Force from 1953 to 1956 as part of their contribution to NATO defences in Europe. Stationed mainly in West Germany, they equipped 11 squadrons until eventually replaced by Hawker Hunters. Britain's first jet fighter with swept wings was the Hawker Hunter, which entered service in July 1954. It was also the first RAF fighter to go into RAF service with radar and fully powered flight controls. Many pilots say that if an aircraft looks right, then it normally is right, and the Hunter definitely falls into this category. Despite teething problems with firing its guns at high altitude, the general design of the aircraft changed little through all its variants and years in service. Pilots loved it. It was strong, handled well, and was very stable, which led to it becoming the aircraft of choice for aerobatics. Both Treble 1 Squadron and subsequently 92 Squadron, the Black Arrows and the Blue Diamonds, flew the F-6 variant of the aircraft in their impressive aerobatic displays. In fact, one of the highlights of air shows worldwide would have to be the Black Arrows' famous 22-ship loop at the annual Farnborough Air Show of 1958. The Hunter was powered by a single Rolls-Royce Avon turbojet, and although it was not supersonic in level flight, it could break the sound barrier in a dive. As well as being easy to fly, the Hunter featured removable weapons packs, which meant that they could be rearmed quickly. As a result, it won many export orders, with some air forces operating their hunters well into the 1990s. In RAF service, the hunter was replaced by the much faster English Electric Lightning during 1963. However, the hunter was found a new role, providing close air support. A two-seat trainer version was also developed for the RAF, with side-by-side -side seating, entering service in 1957. They continued in the training role until finally being retired in the 1990s. By the end of its RAF career as a frontline interceptor, the Hunter was serving alongside a very different kind of fighter. The English Electric Lightning could fly at twice the speed of sound, and was designed around an integrated radar and weapon system to enable it to fight beyond visual range. Initially, the Lightning was armed with two Fire Streak air-to-air -air missiles. The idea was that these would be sufficient to bring down an attacking nuclear-armed Soviet bomber. The first Lightnings had very limited endurance. Its twin Rolls-Royce Avons were intended to get the aircraft into the combat zone in as short a time as possible from takeoff. It was certainly never envisaged that Lightnings would fly combat air patrols. But the development of in-flight refueling and the addition of an enlarged fuel tank greatly improved the Lightnings range. In 1968, the Lightnings of No. 74 Squadron set a new world record when they flew all the way to Tenga in Singapore using in-flight refueling. A two-seat T5 trainer version was also introduced as the RAF did not have any other aircraft that were anywhere near as fast as the Lightning. 
When the McDonnell Douglas F4 Phantom first appeared, some said it looked as though it was designed upside down. Others said it was like putting wings on a brick. But when the aircraft flew, all those comments disappeared. The Phantom went on to become one of the most successful fighters in history. The prototype first flew in May 1958, and it was less than three years before the first operational aircraft reached naval squadrons in 1961 for fleet defence. Almost immediately, the US Marine Corps followed with their requirement for a close air support fighter bomber. Finally, the US Air Force realised the potential of the Phantom, evaluated borrowed naval aircraft and ordered their own replacements for their F-104 Starfighters. When the F-4C model was delivered in 1963, it meant that for the first time one fighter was being used by all three US services on the front line at the same time. The F-4 Phantom II, as it was designated, was an all-weather twin-engine fighter that could fly at twice the speed of sound. Its versatility meant that it became the chosen aircraft for no less than 11 Allied nations, including Britain's Royal Navy and Air Force. The first real test for the Phantom came during the Vietnam War. They fought continuously with a variety of Soviet-built MiGs and in air-to-air -air combat they came out well ahead. Although the Phantom was originally conceived as a fighter armed only with air-to-air -air missiles, it also scored the first supersonic kill using machine guns when a North Vietnamese MiG-19 was successfully shot down at Mach 1.2. Phantoms were also used in a variety of other roles, including ground attack, ground support and tactical reconnaissance. Many years later, Phantoms were still being used in Operation Desert Storm, the 1991 Gulf War, to take out enemy missile sites. In Britain, Phantoms were procured after a long and painful political struggle. The RAF was seeking replacements for the Canberra and Hunter. Initially, the highly advanced BAC TSR2 was to be the replacement, but on cancellation, the search began once more. Eventually, the Phantom was chosen for both services. They remained as key elements of the Royal Navy's defences until the late 1970s, while the RAF operated them for a further 10 years until replaced by the Tornado. The last US-built Phantom was delivered to South Korea in 1979, while the Japanese continued to build under license until 1981. By that time, more than 5,000 of these great aircraft had been built, incorporating regular updates in avionics, engines and weapon systems. In 2016, the US Air Force continues to operate both manned and unmanned QF-4 test aircraft. Even before the United States entered the war in 1941, it had identified the need for an intercontinental bomber or super bomber. The B-29 Super Fortress, although not intercontinental, could fly higher and faster than the Japanese fighters sent up to try and intercept them. The B-29 was also the first bomber to drop an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, which was to bring the war in the Pacific to an end. But the search for a bomber that could launch attacks from home soil in America continued. The Convair B-36 Peacemaker certainly had the range and payload and was the largest piston-engine aircraft to see operational service. In fact, it was so large, the B-29 was redesignated as a medium bomber. In 1955, the B-36 was replaced by an even more powerful aircraft, the Boeing B-52 Stratofortress. Incredibly, the B-52 has been in operational service for over 60 years. Legend has it that the aircraft was designed in a hotel room in Ohio over a weekend. The result was an eight-engine jet that was America's first long-range swept-wing heavy bomber. <laughs>
It began service as an intercontinental high-altitude nuclear bomber. And over the years, its operational capabilities were adapted to meet changing defence needs. B-52s have been modified for low-level flight, conventional bombing, extended range flights and transport of improved defensive and offensive equipment, including ballistic and cruise missiles that can be launched hundreds of miles from their targets. The B-52's combat career began in Vietnam. Since then, B-52s have played a role in every major conflict. Amazingly, it has survived in the role despite the arrival of newer aircraft like the B-1B Lancer and the B-2 Stealth Bomber. What's more, the B-52 has the capability to remain in service until 2040. After the Second World War, the Royal Air Force was responsible for carrying Britain's nuclear deterrent, which at that time was a large freefall bomb. In time, this became an air-launched guided nuclear missile called Blue Steel. Three different bombers were ordered that came to be known as the V-Force. The first of the V-Force aircraft to enter service was the Vickers Valiant in 1955, followed by the Avro Vulcan and then the Handley Page Victor. The Avro Vulcan was arguably the most dramatic design of the trio. Even today, the Vulcan's enormous delta wing housing four Rolls-Royce Olympus engines never fails to impress. One can only imagine its impact when it first entered service in 1956. The Vulcan carried no defensive weaponry instead relying on its ability to fly fast and high to avoid interception, although they were also equipped with electronic countermeasure systems. But during the 1960s, tactics were changed to low level. The Vulcan proved as capable at low levels as it was at high level operations. Throughout the 60s, Vulcans were kept at 15 minute readiness in case of attack. Once the Royal Navy's submarine-launched Polaris entered service, the V-Force was stood down from such a high level of operational intensity. A fleet of Victor tankers and a single Vulcan achieved the almost impossible when they flew a bombing mission all the way from Ascension Island to Port Stanley on the Falkland Islands during the Anglo-Argentinian conflict of 1982. Vulcans were also converted to the tanker role to provide in-flight refueling, with the last aircraft being retired in 1984. The 1950s and 60s were something of a golden age for British aircraft designers. Britain's aircraft industry was still made up of independent companies chasing the all-important government orders. Aircraft like the Hunter, Lightning and Vulcan set benchmarks for designers around the world. One of the most unusual aircraft to come out of this period was the Hawker Harrier. The Harrier was the world's first aircraft capable of vertical and short takeoff and landing, VSTOL for short. It may seem obvious now, but the benefits of VSTOL technology are many. Armed forces could operate from smaller ships and smaller landing grounds. In fact, they could land, refuel and rearm much closer to the front line, providing almost constant support to ground forces. The project began in 1957, and just three years later, P-1127 prototype began its flight trials. An order followed for nine evaluation aircraft, known as the Kestrel, which began flight trials in 1964. Following the cancellation of a supersonic version, the RAF ordered modified versions of these aircraft in 1966. 
They were designated the GR1 and their role was to provide reconnaissance and close air support to ground forces. A naval version entered service in 1980 and had only been operational for a year before going to war in the Falklands campaign in 1982. During the early 1980s, the Harrier was given a major revamp by McDonnell Douglas in the United States. The result was the GR5, 7 and 9 series of aircraft and the AV-8B for the United States Marine Corps. The Harrier remained in RAF and Navy service until 2010, although it continues in service with the US Marine Corps and will eventually be replaced by the Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II. The Boeing F-15 Eagle began life as a McDonnell Douglas project to find a replacement for the F-4 Phantom. But unlike the Phantom, the new aircraft was intended purely as an air superiority fighter. Today, McDonnell Douglas is now part of Boeing and the F-15 has evolved into a multi-role strike fighter that can fight its way to the target, hit a ground target and then fight its way out at low or high altitude. In fact, the pilot can engage an enemy aircraft at the same time as the weapons officer in the back seat attacks a ground target. The F-15 is a beast of a fighter. Its twin engines can deliver a top speed of Mach 2.5 plus. That's over two and a half times the speed of sound. They are so powerful that it can accelerate while still in a vertical climb. But it retains its maneuverability, which is a vital ingredient in air-to-air -air combat. Since its operational introduction in 1976, F-15s have shot down over 100 enemy aircraft for no losses. In 1989, a strike version entered service as the F-15E Strike Eagle. More than 40 years after first entering service, the F-15 still plays a vital role. Existing and future upgrades are likely to keep it in the front line until at least 2028 and perhaps beyond. In the last years of the Cold War, the Soviet Union, alarmed by the United States' plan to introduce new fighters like the F-15, embarked on developing new aircraft of their own. The result was the Mikoyan MiG-29 Fulcrum, followed by the Sukhoi Su-27 Flanker. The aim was to create two aircraft, each with a different mission. The MiG-29 was a pure, lightweight air combat fighter while the Su-27 was a bigger, long-range interceptor, not unlike the F-15. The Su-27 was also the first Soviet aircraft to use fly-by-wire technology. The MiG-29 arrived first, going into service in 1982. It was a twin-engine fighter designed to counter the F-16. In terms of performance, that's exactly what it did. It came as something of a shock to the US Department for Defence when they first saw images of the aircraft in 1979, as it seemed that the Soviet Union was beginning to catch up with American technology. Following the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, NATO was able to evaluate the Fulcrum's true capabilities. What they discovered was staggering. The Fulcrum could fly at Mach 2.25 and climb to 60,000 feet. Its biggest disadvantage was its very short range, which meant it could only be used tactically to meet local needs. However, in close combat, the German pilots believed it to be almost invincible. Its agility and turn rate, together with an excellent helmet-mounted sight, meant that the Luftwaffe thought it to be unbeatable. MiG-29s were exported to Warsaw Pact countries and Mikoyan also created a downgraded export version for Soviet-friendly countries. The Flanker actually flew for the first time some months before the Fulcrum, but it was not in service until 1985. Bigger and heavier than the Fulcrum, 
it had more than twice the range, allowing it to provide long-range escort for Soviet bombers, such as the Bear and the Backfire. Unlike the Fulcrum, the Flanker had much greater development potential, and modern Russian aircraft, such as the Su-30 and 35, continued the Flanker line of production. The Flanker had what no other contemporary Soviet aircraft had, a true multi-role capability. So it could fly high, escorting bombers, or even attack high-flying American bombers, such as the B-52 and B-1B Lancer. It could be used for air superiority, but could also attack ground targets. One great advantage over the Fulcrum was its ability to track beyond visual range. It is this variety of roles that sees the flanker still in service today and new upgrades coming into service for the foreseeable future. It was first built more than 40 years ago, but the Lockheed Martin F-16 Fighting Falcon is still the second most numerous aircraft in service in the world today, a huge testament to its versatility and durability. The F-16 was originally designed by General Dynamics before it became absorbed into Lockheed Martin in response to an Air Force requirement for a new lightweight fighter. Contracted in 1972, the prototype YF-16 flew for the first time in 1974 and proved to be better than its direct rival Northrop's YF-17. It had greater range, a better performance and possibly the most important factor was considerably cheaper. The US Air Force ordered an initial 650 aircraft and instantly other air forces, particularly in Europe, showed an interest in the F-16 to replace their aging fleet of F-104 Starfighters. The first production F-16, now named the Fighting Falcon, was delivered to the Air Force in 1979. In 1993, General Dynamics sold its aircraft manufacturing business to Lockheed Martin, who have continued building new and upgrading existing aircraft ever since. In total, more than 4,500 F-16s have been built. The F-16 is a single-seat, highly manoeuvrable, lightweight, multi-role air combat fighter. A completely different aircraft to the F-15, it is almost half the weight, single rather than twin-engined and 40% cheaper, but with a Mach 2 capability and a very similar range of weaponry. And while there are now barely 200 F-15s in service with the US Air Force, there are more than 1,200 F-16s. For more than 30 years, the F-16 has been an integral element of the US Air Force, both at home and on deployment abroad. It has taken part in all major overseas conflicts since Desert Storm in 1991, including the Balkans, Iraq in 2003, and throughout the Afghanistan campaign. The sheer volume of F-16s in the US inventory has meant that the Air National Guard units in the USA have become better equipped than ever before. It is also the current aircraft of the Thunderbirds demonstration team. Internationally, the F-16 has become a vital component of some 25 air forces around the world. One of the first, and the first to use it successfully in air combat, was the Israeli Air Force. The current variant used by the US Air Force is the C&D, which was first manufactured in 1984. It featured a major upgrade, and there are plans for another to bring many existing aircraft up to F-16V for Viper standard. At the current rate, F-16s will stay in service until at least 2025 and will only be replaced when the production of the F-35A Lightning II aircraft gets up to speed. If there is a single theme that has emerged over the last 100 years, then it's longevity, closely followed by a multi-role capability. The time it takes to bring new aircraft from drawing board to flight is measured in decades, 
which makes it almost impossible for military planners to know what sort of conflicts they will be fighting. Cost is another major factor. Combat aircraft are spectacularly expensive to make and so service longevity and the multi-role capability become even more important. Another development is the rise of the drone. Unmanned aerial vehicles, or drones, have had a profound impact on air warfare, replacing pilots on missions which are either too dull, dirty or dangerous. As was seen in the Vietnam War, captured pilots paraded on television can have a profound political impact. In years to come, there may well be far fewer aircraft that we can call truly great 